When asked to provide a description of how a piano action works, most pianists would be hard-pressed to give a detailed explanation. Unfortunately for most, the best explanation they can give is that you press the key down on this end, and on that end, the hammer goes up to strike the string. This simplistic understanding of the piano action may be adequate to explain the mechanism of a piano to a pre-kindergartner. But for the person aspiring to become a professional pianist, it seems logical that a thorough understanding of how a piano action accomplishes its work is absolutely essential. The reasons are many. Understanding the mechanism aids in the pursuit of musical expression. Knowing what processes are happening and when can open up wider possibilities for dynamics and the shaping of musical phrases. It can also rid a pianist of certain romantic notions of how a piano key works. An excellent example is when a pianist can be seen holding down a key and wiggling their hand or finger as if to affect vibrato from the strings. That particular affect is one seen fairly often. If the pianist knew how the action worked, he or she would know that that effort is silly and ineffectual. I've explained to you before that the piano action is essentially a folded lever system. It's not hard to imagine why when you see a model up close and watch it in motion. The piano action has been called a Rube Goldberg invention, and it certainly seems like it. The simple goal all along has just been to get the hammer to hit the string. So why all of these intermediate parts? In all honesty, I don't think it's possible to accomplish the goal with fewer parts than are present here. Rather than possessing the inane overindulgence of a Rube Goldberg, I see a rather elegant and robust design that has withstood the test of 300 years in development and utility. First, let's go through a review of the parts of the action and what they're assigned to do. The action model you see here was built with the idea of maximum visibility in mind. You can see all the components of the action quite clearly. First are the parts of the keyframe. The front rail, the balance rail, and the back rail. The keyframe holds the key sticks in place and guides them vertically by means of a balance rail pin and a front rail pin. There are punchings made of wool felt and paper at the front rail. The paper under the front rail felt punching is inserted for the purpose of limiting the key's travel. While the felt punching provides cushioning and noise reduction when the key hits bottom. The balance rail has a bearing which provides an exact pivot point just behind the balance rail pin. Key height can be adjusted by adding punchings underneath the balance rail bearing as needed. The back rail has a heavier cloth as well as an undercloth again for noise reduction as the key returns to rest position. Key tops are made with a variety of plastic these days. One popular plastic is pyrolin, a soft plastic with an off-white color. It was used on Steinway keyboards until about 1984. Most Kluge key sets are made with an acrylic natural and an ebony wood sharp. This one happens to be a Kluge key with an acrylic key top. The key stick, made of pine or, sp or spruce, has been purpose-built with openings at the front rail and at the balance rail. These openings, or mortises, have been lined with wool felt bushings made of a woven cloth. The bushings have the triple role of noise reduction and key alignment, 
all provided with just the right amount of friction. They're the most vulnerable to wear and tear of any part in the action and are meant to be replaced when they become threadbare or divoted and no longer able to keep the key moving in a straight line. The front rail key bushings are installed directly to the key stick wood with animal hide glue. Whereas the balance rail bushing is glued to a button that's glued to the top of the key. The reason for this probably has to do with the manufacturing processes. The bottom of the key is a round hole. The top is a rectangular opening. It's much easier to add a button than to machine a transition from a rectangular hole to a round hole in the same piece of wood. Better just to add another piece of wood. Further along the key stick is the capstan which bridges the keys and their corresponding action stack parts. Further still is the back check, which is tasked with catching the tail of the hammer as it rebounds from the string, preventing the hammer from striking more than once, a failure called bobbling, as well as checking the hammer in an elevated position primed for repeating the note. The very back tip of the key stick has a cushion called key end felt. The role of this rectangular piece of wool felt is to lift the damper lever and the damper head off the string, allowing the string to vibrate freely upon striking, being struck with the hammer. Moving on to the action stack, the repetition, or whippin, is a set of intermediate levers that receive input from the key. The parts of the repetition are the flange, attached to the action frame, the repetition bottom, the bottom flange, which serve to mount all the parts of the repetition, including the jack, the repetition lever, and the reciprocal butterfly spring. Adjustable parts of the repetition include the jack screw and button, the repetition lever screw and button, and of course the reciprocal spring, which is simply bent into adjustment. This particular repetition also has a whippin assist spring which is adjusted by means of its own adjustable screw. The whippin assist spring acts as a substitute for key lead in this example. You'll note that I have no key leads in this key stick. The hammer shank is attached to the action frame by its own flange and screw. The flange has an adjustment screw that interacts with the heel of the repetition lever for the purpose of adjusting the hammer drop. The hammer shank has a round member called a knuckle or roller which is positioned directly above the jack. When properly aligned with the jack it creates the power line when the key is at rest. The power line is this straight line through the center of the roller or knuckle and the back end, back side of the jack. At the end of the shank, of course, is the hammer head, consisting of a wooden molding that incorporates the tail and, of course, the wool felt coverings. The hammer head is glued to the hammer shank at precisely 130 millimeters distance from its molding core to the action center on the hammer shank flange. The action frame is screwed onto the key frame. 
it has a, it's a series of brackets and support rails, three support rails. One for the repetition flanges, one for the let off screw and button, and one for the hammer shank. The damper system consists of a damper tray and felt, which is activated by the damper pedal, of course. The damper under lever is attached by its own flange, which is here and a little difficult to see. The under lever also has what's called a top flange incorporating the sostenuto tab. The damper wire enters the top flange and guides the damper head with the help of the damper guide rail bushing. This red piece of felt here. The head is a wooden molding onto which the damper felts are glued, again with hot animal hide glue. Lastly, the damper stop rail is a slat of wood with a felt cushion that prevents the damper under lever from traveling excessively. How it all works. When an action is properly set up and regulated, it provides for a hammer to key travel ratio of 5 to 1. That is, for every one unit of vertical key travel, the hammer travels five units. This is known as the action ratio, and is the standard for which most piano actions are designed. For the approximately three-eighths of an inch of key travel, or 375 thousandths of an inch, that the key will travel, the hammer will travel 15 eighths of an inch, or 1 and 7 eighths inches. Most models of grand piano will hew to this standard. An exception is the Steinway D 9 foot, in which the hammer travels a full 2 inches on a key travel of 0.4 inches. Now, for a sense of true spiel art, an action setup in this manner would align all the parts in their best geometric relationship to one another. The key stick would have a perfect 2 to 1 key ratio from the front of the key to the balance rail pin and from the balance rail pin to the capstan. And the magic line would be a perfectly straight line that would go from the repetition center flange action center through the center of the capstan to the fulcrum of the key with the key stick depressed halfway. This represents the distance of a half key travel. And if I take this string, I can illustrate to you the magic line. There's the repetition center. And the string goes halfway through the cap through through the capstan down to the fulcrum in a perfectly straight line. Again, that's called the magic line. When the key stick is depressed, a lot of motion results. The capstan rises, causing the repetition to rotate on its flange. The rotating repetition pushes up the hammer shank and hammer toward the string. As the repetition is traversing upward, the jack tender and the heel of the repetition lever arrive simultaneously at their respective adjustment screws. The drop screw here and the let off button here. This simultaneous feature is the reason for the title double escapement when describing the modern piano action. Continuing upward as the key stick depresses further down, the jack is tripped out from its position directly beneath the knuckle, thus hurling the hammer unfettered towards the string for a free flight distance 
of approximately one to one and a half millimeters. The tripping of the jack is the actual motion that is known as escapement. During its rebound from the string, which takes only a split second, the hammer is literally caught by the tail by the back check. Owing to its position on the opposite side of the key, the back check has been rising all along during the downward stroke of the key. The back check holds the hammer in check at a distance of about 12 millimeters or half an inch from the string. And the spring has been compressed, sort of like a clothespin, ready for the jack to reset itself under the knuckle for the purpose of quick repetition. With the slightest release of finger pressure, the hammer is released from the back check. The repetition spring then plays its role, providing an upward push to the repetition lever, which in turn holds the hammer shank and hammer in a high enough position that enables the jack to slide quickly back under the knuckle for a repeat of the note. All of this takes place in the blink of an eye. Now, it must be noted that during pianissimo play, the hammer sometimes does not get checked because the hammer's rebound is not sufficient to reach the back check. That's okay though, because the repetition lever simply remains elevated by the repetition spring, allowing the jack to still get back under the knuckle. In the meantime, at the end of the key, the damper under lever and the damper have been lifted by the end of the key. The under levers are activated about one third of the way through the keystroke, right about there. This all occurs just in time for the hammer to excite the string and the damper remains lifted as long as the key stick is depressed, allowing for the string to vibrate freely until the key is let go. And that's how it all works. I'll play the key several more times in this video to give you a chance to concentrate your gaze on different parts of the action in turn in order to better understand what is actually happening. 